The following is distributed by the Berean Call. showed us some pretty horrific stuff and I want to make a couple of comments about it. See, sometimes we go through things so fast. If you haven't been, how many of you do not get the brain call? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Well, I, two or three people. Okay. So if you've read the brain call, you know, we've had a lot to say about the passion and I want to just make a further explanation. Um, so many evangelical pastors praise this as biblical. I'll, go, I'll take you very quickly. You may have heard me do this before. I'll take you very quickly through it. Jesus is in the garden. Here comes a big snake. He stands up and stomps on it. Not in the Bible. Did not happen. It's a device of the director to arouse the emotions of the audience. Here comes Pilate's wife with a roll of linens gives it to the Marys to wipe up the blood. Did not happen, not in the Bible, not biblical. What about Jesus knocked over uh, and uh, he's dangling on a chain and under the bridge, over a bridge and under the bridge, there is Judas whom he confronts. Did not happen, not in the Bible, not biblical. It is a device of the director to arouse the emotion of the audience. Now, furthermore, most of this came from the visions of a mystic nun. On the way to the Via Della Rosa, on the way to the cross, here comes Saint, uh, Saint um, not Teresa, Veronica. Thank you, ex-Catholics. <laughs> here, here comes Saint Veronica handing her veil to Jesus. He wipes his face on it. And then you see her standing over to the side. There's the face of Jesus on the veil. That is where the first icon came from. <clears throat> You're on, he's on the cross. Um, a, a raven plucks the eye out of one of, the, uh, one of the thieves next to him. Not in the Bible. Did not happen. Not biblical. How could so many evangelical pastors praise this as biblical? Oh, this is the gospel. It's not the gospel. You get the impression from that film that it was the endless beating and beating and beating of Jesus by the Roman soldiers. That's what paid the penalty for our sins. God was using the Roman soldiers to punish Jesus for our sins. Now you figure that one out. Wicked soldiers are God's instrument to execute his justice upon Jesus for the sins of the world? not biblical. It's a false gospel. Where does our salvation come from? Isaiah 53, it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. Thou hast put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He was made sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. That is not done by Roman soldiers beating Jesus. That's the only salvation message you would get. It's a false gospel. How can evangelical pastors praise this as biblical? Well, we could say more about that, but that's enough. The secret. Again, uh, Tom wasn't able to show you enough that you would understand. Well, it, it, it was there. What's the secret? It's, not, it's, it's the same lie, as he said, from the Garden of Eden. But this is what Norman Vincent Peale taught. This is what Robert Schuller teaches. This is what the positive confession. It's in your mind, the power of words. You can have whatever you want, be whatever you want. You just claim it, name it, and claim it, and so forth. And they go into that in detail in The Secret. And the world is buying this ridiculous lie. You would think any idiot would know it's not true. And, and, and you can take the great masters of the secret 
and go down the list. One of them died at the age of 51. Well, I think he probably would have wanted to live a little longer. Uh, and many of them died rather young, died in poverty, in ill health. How about that? It doesn't work. If it worked, these guys could live forever. Have whatever you want. Be what, I, it's, the lie is so obvious, and yet they love it. It's very difficult to get, to get the truth across. Well, so my topic this morning is Judgment Day, What and Why. Now, when I wrote the book Judgment Day, we, well, we do have a little humor sometimes in the staff, and uh, some of the staff, I forget who it was, suggested, well, we should have a little smiley face on the front. Uh, <laughs> and uh, a subtitle can be, have a nice judgment day. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 of course, we want to be positive about every murder. And you understand that positive and negative are meaningless terms when it comes to biblical matters, spiritual matters, truth. Truth is neither positive nor negative. It's just truth. Take it like you get it. Uh, if you're into chemistry or, you know, magnetism or electricity or whatever, then positive and negative have some meaning. Now, Judgment Day, what and why? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We all know that. Everything begins with God. I think I just wrote an article, did I? I can't remember. Uh, is showing that why is there sin in the world? Because of God. He created everything. He started this whole thing going. And I won't go into that. Why is there an eternal hell? Because of God, who made man in his image, who is an eternal being. Uh, when you die, your body molds in the grave. That's not the end of you. You don't think with your brain. Your brain does not think. Your brain does not originate your thoughts. If your brain originated your thoughts, you'd be a prisoner of your brain. What's my brain going to think of next? Oh, my goodness sakes. Uh, this is just another materialistic lie. It's, it's nonsense. You are the thinker. You are a non-physical, eternal being made in the image of God, living inside of a physical body. You are the one who makes the choices. You use your brain like a computer to operate your body. But when that computer is dead, the software is still going. I don't know those terms, hardware or whatever. Something's going. You, you, are, you still exist and you will give an account to your creator. Now, the creator is in charge. Very simply, he makes the rules, doesn't he? But people don't want God to make the rules. You can't even play a game without rules. But, no, we don't want God to make the rules. We want to do our own thing. Some of you know and some of you have asked about our eldest uh, daughter, Jana. You're praying for it, and I appreciate that very much. She has cancer, a very serious case. Um, began with breast cancer, and by the time they realized it, it was in, in the bone, the blood, the liver, and so forth and then got into the brain, so you can pray for her. But what is cancer? Cancer is a cell that has kicked over the traces. It's not doing what the DNA tells it to do. It's not following the instructions that God put in there. And man is a cancer in this universe, doing his own thing. God gave Ten Commandments. They're not Ten Suggestions. These are Ten Commandments. And the penalty for breaking them is death, separation. Cancer has to be cut out. You will be cut out of God's universe. It's that simple. It couldn't be otherwise. Now, how could you cure cancer? Well, they don't know how to do this yet, but you would have to bring it back in a right relationship with the DNA instructions. 
By the way, the DNA instruction manual is so fantastic, and I know very little about it. Yes, there is a book here. Uh, just to let you know a little bit of what we're doing, Psychology in the Church. Now, I'm, I'm, you've probably figured it out. You turn it over like that, and you've got Occult Invasion. This is a book that I wrote. That's, I'm updating it. And you will see, these are the chapters that will be in it, but the ones that are in dark print, I think it tells you that, are the ones that are in this. This is just a sample. Um, you know, psychology, well, I've added an awful lot to what we wrote about psychology. And um, Tom mentioned it, and uh, I want to see if I can find it here, because he was talking a bit about the church. Well, we'll come to that later, but while I'm thinking of it, let's just do it. Uh, this it will shock you. Uh, we'll just give you the facts. This is off of Norman Vincent Peale's homepage. Uh, now, he taught the secret. That was his, his thing. He's a heretic on the Phil Donahue show years ago. He sa said, it's not necessary to be born again. You've got your way to heaven. I got my way. I found eternal peace in the Shinto shrine. And Phil Donahue was shocked. But you're a Christian minister. You're supposed to tell me Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and life. Peel said, no, he's one of the ways. There are other ways. Now, this man is praised by Billy Graham, who endorses his books. Uh, of course, he's the mentor of Robert Schuller, which he freely admits we got some very serious problems. Now, you get a little background on who Norma Vincent Peale is. He was into the secret. This is his homepage. In 1937, Peale established a clinic with Freudian psychiatrist Dr. Smiley Blanton in the basement of the Marble Collegiate Church. Blanton brought with him the extensive experience of having undergone psychoanalysis by Freud himself in Vienna in 1929, 35, 36, and 37. The clinic was described as having a theoretical base that was union with a strong evidence of neo and post Freudianism. It subsequently grew into an operation with more than 20 psychiatric doctors and so forth and so on. Uh, then a little more history of that. Here's what they say. Indeed, this is his homepage. Peel pioneered the merger of theology and psychology, which became known as Christian psychology. You want to know where Christian psychology came from? It came from Norman Vincent Peel, uh, an arch heretic, if there ever was one. Now, I'm reading from, just to skip on, because I'm not even supposed to be talking about this. Uh, <laughs> skip on, according to J. Harold Ellens, author of a section on Peel in the Baker Encyclopedia of Psychology and Counseling, Peel's work was initially scorned by ministers and therapists alike, the entire, let me see, where, where am I? I'm trying to skip. Uh, he, was, he was three quarters of a century ahead of his time. He saw psychology and Christian experience as very compatible. He had the courage to stand pat on this position in spite of the opposition of the entire Christian church for nearly half a century. You get that? For half a century, the entire evangelical church said, Christian psychology, there's no such thing. You can't have that in the church, and now they're the heroes. Okay, well, that just gives you an idea of some of the things we're concerned about. So, a couple of new books coming up, and then um, another book that I'm working on uh, called Cosmos Creator and Human Destiny. You may not be aware of it, but there is a group call, who call themselves the New Atheists. Why do they call themselves the New Atheists? because the old atheists were too mild. These men, Richard Dawkins, a geneticist from Oxford University and others, uh, are very aggressive. They, these, these are their terms. We are going to evangelize the world with atheism. Christianity or the belief in God is not only wrong, it is wicked, and we're going to stamp it out. Okay, so I'm taking on these guys. They've got PhDs and 
astrophysics and, and uh, you know, genetics and all kinds of other things. Uh, I'm just a nobody. But so you can pray for me. And uh, we're going to uh, just uh, take these guys on. So that's Cosmos, Creator, and Human Destiny. Now, the Creator is in charge. He gave the commandments. You don't like it? Sorry. He's, you don't negotiate with God. You, you don't hire a, some attorneys, some sharp Beverly Hills attorneys, to see if you can't beat the rap. What was the first commandment? Well, people say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Jesus says this is the first commandment, but no, there, there, there was a commandment for the Ten Commandments. What was it? Well, save time. I'm not going to ask you uh, a rhetorical question. Oh, don't eat of that tree. Yes, that was a commandment that preceded the Ten Commandments, but that's not the first commandment. What was the first commandment God gave? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the homosexuals, well, we got a lot about them going on these days. They defy God. The very first commandment, they have broken it. They defy it. They, do, they are not fruitful. They do not multiply. Well, except by converting little kids and so forth uh, in school. They have thumbed their noses at God. And I don't know how you can have a gay pride parade and boast about this lifestyle, which if everyone else adopted it, it is the end of the human race. Understand that? Okay, this is how God started the human race off. Be fruitful, multiply. And he brought Adam and Eve together. It's not just a matter of immorality. See, we, we get the wrong picture. Whatever you and I do that is wrong is not against ourselves or against other people. Primarily, it is against God. He created us. He gave us the commandments. This is how we're supposed to behave. He made us in his image. And of course, that image is, has been marred. It's been destroyed. God is love. He gave man the power of choice so we could love. What has happened to everything? It's been perverted and corrupted by man. So young man sits in the back of a car in a car with a young lady and says, I love you. What he probably means, and he may not even understand it, and she only finds out too late, I love me and I want you. So even love has been corrupted and, and perverted. Now, you remember Genesis 18.25, Abraham is pleading for Sodom because Lot is living there. And one of the arguments he uses, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Well, of course. Well, you, you wouldn't destroy Sodom. Wouldn't the judge of all the earth do right? Yes. So God destroyed Sodom. This is God's judgment upon homosexuality, lesbianism. It defies him in the very first commandment, the very uh, first thing he said to mankind. So if you're going to say the judge of all the earth does not do right, then you're going to have to be on the side of the homosexuals who somehow have got, become a privileged class. You can't talk against them but you can say anything you want against God, against Jesus Christ, against Christianity, but you dare not talk against this perversion. Okay, and I won't continue on. Now, God gave us a law. What does the law prove? Well, it, it proves that man has choice. If we don't have a free will, and you know Martin Luther wrote an entire book titled Bondage of the Will. He tried to prove that man does not have a free will. John Calvin did not believe that man had a free will. There's so many people. Well, wait a minute. Well, now, now, now if, if God is sovereign, don't you believe God is sovereign? If you were, if you were getting the Brian call, then you remember I, I wrote a, an article in the Brian call, What a Sovereign God Cannot Do. I try to get Christians to think. Most people don't think. 
When you read the Bible, you're supposed to think as well. Well, you dare to say that there's a, that God, there's things God can't do? Well, it says with, with God, nothing is impossible. Well, he can't lie. He can't be wrong. He can't make a mistake. You know, he can't even travel. I think you know that. Uh, for you who didn't get it, he's omnipresent. Uh, and he cannot forgive sin unless the penalty is paid. That's what's wrong with every religion out there, including Catholicism. Tom was explaining it to you. It's a works religion. Christianity is not about what I must do to be saved. It's what Christ has done. And I put my faith and trust in him. So we do have the power of choice. If we didn't have the power of choice, uh, what's the point of giving a law? If we have no freedom, no choice, we must do whatever God tell, makes us do, then of course he's the author of sin. And that doesn't make sense. So it comes down to obedience. We're talking about what is, what and why is Judgment Day? First of all, we're talking about the judgment upon individuals. Then we'll come to the judgment upon Islam and the nations, God willing, this afternoon. And then Saturday morning, we'll talk about judgment upon Israel and the church. But now we're talking about God's judgment upon individuals. And I think this is a neglected topic. I don't know if you uh, remember the old Negro spiritual. Uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Now you think of this. I think it was Werner von Braun, a uh, German uh, space scientist who became the father. Uh, we got him over here in the U.S. and he became the father of America's space program. A Christian, a believer. By the way, you probably don't know, and I talk about some of these things in my new book, Cosmos, Creator, and Human Destiny, that you're going to pray for. You probably don't know what the first uh, food and drink consumed on the moon was, do you? It was communion. It was the bread and wine that the astronauts brought there to partake of. Say, oh, they're, they're atheists. No, no. These are scientists. You know, the first team that circled the moon, they broadcast back to this earth. They said, we have a message I think that was Apollo 8. And we have a message for planet Earth. What was it? They read the first 10 verses of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and, and the earth. So God is in charge. Man doesn't want him to be, uh, to be in charge. We've got serious problems. And Werner von Braun, who said he, it was science. It was looking at the universe that caused him to believe in God. It didn't happen by chance. Uh, there's no way that you, could, uh, that you could say that. And he said, Werner von Braun, I'm just going by memory, probably a paraphrase, but he said, the stage was set for an event unprecedented, and it will never be duplicated again. In the history of mankind, God would come, this, the Creator would come to this earth as a man to walk among his creatures, and they would nail him to a cross. Make that make you tremble? Makes me tremble. See, we don't have much trembling in the church, not much fear. Not much fear of God. And uh, we need something like that. I need more of the fear of God. He's going to bring every work into judgment. 
with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And we'll find out when we talk about it Sunday morning. The first, we look forward to the rapture. But what's the first thing that faces us after the rapture? The judgment seat of Christ. There is a judgment coming. It's coming for all mankind and for all the nations. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That was Elijah's challenge to Israel. And uh, it's incredible what we see going on today. The Father has committed all judgment to the Son because he's the Son of Man. We're going to be judged by a man. You say, well, how, how could God know the temptations that I face? You're going to face a man, I'm, none of you, I hope, uh, but those who are there. And it's, you're, by the way, the, the judgment, the great white throne judgment is not to see whether you're guilty or are you, whether you're going to make it. It's to pronounce the penalty. We're already guilty. All of sin that comes short of the glory of, of, of God. But we're going to face a man. We Christians at the judgment seat of Christ can't say, well, you don't know what trials I endured. I mean, God, you're so lofty. No, he became a man. And he was tempted, tested in every part, in, in everything like we are, but without sin. So it's going to follow, punishment is going to follow the judgment by God. He's already pronounced it upon everyone. And our own conscience demands this. We I mean, we live in a world, it's, it's just astonishing. The, the staff made my screensaver uh, headline news, you know. And here they come across, oh my gracious, uh, whenever I don't happen to be using it. What is going on today? The sins just get worse and worse and worse. There's no fear of God. If there were fear of God, we, I don't know how, whether you've noticed it, and I don't read the newspaper, I don't have time for it, and I don't watch TV, I don't have time for that. But I get my news, and these little screen savers come floating across, and I don't remember within the last few weeks how many fathers or mothers have killed their spouses and their children and then shot themselves. What? Well, one thing would stop it. After death, the judgment. It's appointed a man once today, but after death, the judgment. Now, if they really believe that, you see, they look up, people who commit suicide look upon suicide as a way out. Hitler thought he was escaping by committing suicide. He escaped the Allies, but he didn't escape God's. It's appointed as a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. And anyone who really believed that, you couldn't murder someone and then think you're going to escape by killing yourself. It's just incredible. You couldn't possibly do it. So you see, there's really a practical atheism, even among those, well, 92%. 92 to 95 percent of the people in the United States today claim to be believers in God. Of course, what God do they believe in? Higher power or some cosmic energy source, a Star Wars force, whatever. Uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, very, very few would believe in the true God. But if a person really and truly believes in God, that's going to stop you from doing anything that he is going to punish you for. So we have a kind of a practical atheism in, 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 our, in our lives. Uh, it's, um, it causes me to doubt, and some of you may take exception to this. It causes me to doubt that today's false prophets even believe in God. I'll give you a couple of examples here. This is, uh, well, here's a gentleman 
This was the new sentinel of new sentinel of Knoxville, Tennessee. And this was a letter that was written to the editor. Upon the urging of my terminally ill wife, I poured hundreds of dollars into the Oral Roberts empire. She was brainwashed into the belief that he and God would restore her. Approximately one year after her death, she received a letter over the signature of Oral Roberts in which he claimed that he had a talk with God the previous night who had assured him that my wife would be made whole. This so much incensed me that I turned the letter over and replied in substance that he was a liar, that God never told him any such thing, that God knew she had been in heaven for about a year. I received no reply. Now, Oral Roberts has gotten all kinds of messages like that. I have a letter uh, in which she's been up all night praying for me. This is over his signature. And God has revealed to him 33 specific blessings with which he wants to bless me. Of course, the secret of the thing is send in a seed faith offering. Uh, now, several hundred thousand other people got the same letter. Of course, the computer puts their name in it, like my name is put in there. And Oral Roberts has been up all night praying for all of them. You know that is a flat-out lie. It's just a device to get some money from people. That man has no fear of God. He couldn't be a Christian. He can't even believe in God. If he really believed in God, he would be afraid to lie like that. Uh, Oral Roberts, you remember, he said he had a nine... A seven-hour talk with a 900-foot Jesus who told him to build a hospital in Tulsa that anybody knew wasn't needed. But with pressure from him, um, he got it through the planning commission. 777 high-rise, 777-bed uh, high-rise hospital. Never had more than 148 beds occupied. Went bankrupt. They had to move the praying hands, you know, over to Oral Roberts Universe that had been there in front of this hospital, uh, and uh, the year he went bankrupt, he was voted the outstanding Christian leader uh, by uh, a, a group of people. Now, Benny Hinn, I could talk about a lot of others, but we, we don't have time. And Benny Hinn, I will say it to his face, he is a bald-faced liar. He lies. Uh, I'll give you some examples. My wife and I were in South Africa. We've probably heard some of these examples before. And a man, he had a huge crusade there, thousands of people. And a man fell out of, the, of his chair into the aisle. They carried him out. Benny Hinn says, don't worry about it. God has just told me he'll be healed. He died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Is that a false prophecy? Was it a lie that God had just told him the man would be healed? Of course it was a lie, something he made up. And yet he carries on the more false, I could tell you about many more in, in Switzerland. He prophesied over a man that he had supposedly he, healed of cancer. Uh, a huge ministry, many years, God is going to bless you. And you'll have a great ministry. Two days later, the man died. Is that a false prophecy? Of course it is. Is it a lie? God never told him that any more than a 900-foot Jesus talked to Oral Roberts for seven hours. And you remember he needed $8 million to, or God would kill him. There's no fear of God with this man. And that $8 million, which he got, was supposed to go for uh, scholarships uh, for medical doctors in his medical school uh, and so that they could get out into the mission field. I can tell you not one dime went for that. Not one dime, and the thing went bankrupt. Is that a lie? Oh, some people say, how can you be bad-mouthing these men of God? If you think they're men of God, and I'm bad-mouthing them, I'm only telling you the facts. And they can't be men of God, because they lie about God. Remember Benny Hinn, uh, December 31st, uh, 1989, at his church in Orlando at that time. He's right in the throne room of God. God says, I am going to destroy the homosexual community in America by fire. Uh, by 1994 or 95 at the latest. I never read about it in the newspaper. And the homosexuals are stronger than ever. Was that a lie? Yes, it was a false prophecy, but it was also a lie. 
He claimed he was in the throne room of God, and God told him this. So he tells lies on God's behalf. I think that is a very serious offense. But the more lies he tells and the, the more false prophecies, the larger his ministry goes. He's had as many uh, as um, one million people at one meeting in Nigeria and in the Philippines and so forth. He can't even get his testimony straight. Well, let, let me just skip on. In the PTL family devotional, he says, I got, I'm quoting, I got saved in Israel in 1968. Uh, but in a 1983 message in St. Louis, he said, it was in Canada that I was born again right after 68. Yet in Good Morning Holy Spirit, he says he was converted in 1972 during his senior year in high school. But he dropped out before his senior year. When did he get saved? I mean, if you're going to lie, you ought to at least have a good enough memory to remember what you said last time. Uh, he teaches that we're little gods, and Tom talked about that. Paul Crouch put out a newsletter. We're little gods, and if we're not, I'll apologize before 10,000 times 10,000 in front of the glassy, the glassy sea. If he's a little God, he will not be there. Uh, that's for sure. Because God says, you say through Jeremiah, you say to the gods who didn't create this heaven and this earth, they will perish from under this heaven and from this earth. Anyone who says he's a God and did not create the heavens and the earth, he is going to perish. You think God is going to put up with that? Uh, well, Christians put up with it. And they follow him. And Benny Hinn is such a gracious man uh, on TBN. He said, I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun. I'll blow your head off. Well, he was talking about me. And, and not, not uh, um, among others, and not to be outdone, Morris Cirillo stands up there and he says, when we stand up here, brother, you're not looking at Morris Cirillo. You're looking at God. You're looking at Jesus. And so... In fulfillment of Christ's words, they will come in my name, saying, I am Christ's. And we have it within the, the, the Christian uh, uh, the church. Now, Judgment Day. What, what is this? What's it about? Well, we're talking about it in relationship to individuals. I remember my father used to tell a story from the old country, you know, that was England, about this little boy, to get rid of him, almost for babysitting purposes, his dad, who was a burglar, um, put him in Sunday school. And he learned some things in Sunday school. And uh, his dad had him out on a job with him, and he's going to about to crawl in a window, and he says, now, now Sonny, I want you to look both ways. Look that way and this way and keep looking that way and then you've got to give me this, the alarm if somebody starts coming. The little boy says, but Daddy, you forgot one way to look. Well, what's that? Up, he said. He learned in the little chorus in Sunday school, anybody remember it? You cannot hide from God. You cannot hide from God. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you cannot hide from God. His eye is fixed on you. Ah, that got me when I was a little boy in Sunday school. <laughs> you cannot hide from God, but they don't sing those songs in most Sunday schools anymore. Where are we? Is judgment coming? I believe judgment is coming. Turn to, uh, to Isaiah 13. What is this judgment day? Well, it's called the day of the Lord. It's not a 24-hour period. It's an eternal period. Verse 6, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. It takes in everything we'll be talking about in these my first three, three talks. It's going to be a judgment upon Islam. It's going to be a judgment upon all the nations. 
talk about that this afternoon. It's going to be a judgment upon Israel. Yes, Israel. Israel is under God's judgment now. You know that. Moses said, Deuteronomy 28 and other places in Deuteronomy, go back and read that book again. You just, so I bring you into this land. They're carrying their idols with them. I think you know that. Remember when, when uh, Jacob is on his way to meet Esau, and they say, oh, here comes Esau. He's got all these warriors with him and so forth. Well, Jacob wants to get right with God. He wants to get right with Jehovah. What does he say? Let's get rid of these idols. Let's just smash them. No. He says, get all the idols and hide them under the sycamore tree. Yeah, we're going to come back and get to them again. Once we get past Esau, you know. Oh, everybody gets very religious when there's problems. But their vow doesn't last and they're back to their own ways. You think God is going to tolerate that? He can tolerate that. I often say, I've been in homes where that little two-year-old uh, ought to have an emperor's crown or an empress's crown because they run the family. You know what I'm talking about. You don't cross her. You don't cross him. Whoa, you walk on eggs. I mean, if we, if we try to discipline them, they'll make the loudest screech. You wouldn't dare to do it in, in, in public because they'll accuse you of child abuse. You know, we used to apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning, but that's child abuse now. And we are in, uh, uh, this is a rebellious generation. They don't want to go by anybody's rules. They make their own rules. And this is the story of mankind. And God is not going to tolerate it. You, you don't have to think very deeply to realize judgment is coming. It's going to fall. It's going to fall on this world. It's going to fall on every individual who rejects Christ. Those who are not covered by the blood of the Lamb. And one of the things that I was going to just look, uh, read from, from Judgment Day, but I don't have it here. It doesn't matter. Uh, going to punish Christians. Some of them are not Christians. We already talked about some of them. They pretended to be Christians. They've misused the name of God, taken the name of God in vain. That doesn't mean just swearing. That means attributing things to God that are not true. You've given God a bad name. You've ruined his reputation. This is why people look at TBN, and I, if that's, I, forget it. Uh, it. They hold God up to ridicule. He's going to punish those people who call themselves Christians. They will be punished. And then there are others who are opposed to Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye. We'll talk about that this afternoon. He says that three times. You dare to say that Israel has been replaced by the church? It's a popular teaching. Replacement theology. Uh, the Knox Seminary, for example, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, founded by D. James Kennedy, they put out a, a paper. By the way, how many of you, I'm not going to ask you how many of you own it, how many of you have actually read Judgment Day? Well, quite a few. That's amazing. That's encouraging. Now, get it in your local library, please. We need to get that message out. We'll talk more about that. But if you had one, you could look at pages 276 and 277. Knox Seminary. These are Calvinists. Israel has been replaced. And they say, there is not a verse in the Bible that says that the Middle East, any property in the Middle East belongs to a particular ethnic group. What? What Bible have they been reading? Uh, and they go on to say that, oh, well, all the promises to Israel were fulfilled in, during the life of Joshua. But Joshua lived 110 years. And there are infinite, I mean, forever. You go to, um, just look at, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, and I don't want to do that. But, but you know the scriptures. Look at First Chronicles. First Chronicles 16, verse 14. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, 
even of the covenant which he made with Paul. and uh, No, no. Covenant he made with Abraham, his oath unto Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law, and to Israel for, uh, for an everlasting covenant, uh, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Palestine. That what it says? We'll talk about that this afternoon. I choke on that word. It's the land of Israel, but it was the land of Canaan. It was Canaan to begin with. The lot of your inheritance. It's an everlasting covenant. And look at verse 9, back to Isaiah 13. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. Uh, the stars of the heaven, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll not give their light. I'm going to, verse 11, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. There is a judgment day coming. And just turn quickly. We'll come back to this later, but go to Jeremiah 23. See, I don't know what Bible these people read. They read it with a prejudice against Israel. They say, oh, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm just against Israel. Well, <laughs> notice verse 7, Jeremiah 23, 7. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord. They shall no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. That happened in the day of Joshua. But the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country for all countries whither I had driven them, and they will dwell in their own land. What's the big news today? Jews have come back to Israel for more than 100 nations. That's what the big news is, and that did not happen in the day of Joshua. So for them to say, it all happened then, I don't know what Bible they're reading, and that's a problem. We'll talk about that uh, a bit later. Tom alluded to that. Look, we're... We're going to go, we're going to be like the Bereans. That's why we call it the Berean call. We're going to go by the Bible. This is, this is God's Word. When you read the Bible on your knees, or however you read it, this is God's love letter to mankind. These are the words of the living God spoken through His prophets. It's infallible. It is sufficient. We don't need anything else, but what is happening today? Oh, we're turning everything on. And we're rewriting it. We'll talk about that uh, later if we, if we get to it. You know about these things. Judgment Day. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And I don't know about you, but it causes me to tremble. I know that Christ redeemed me with his blood. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that he loves me. But I can tell you, when I think, and I think of it often, standing before the creator of this universe, and Christ's eyes like flames of fire, his feet as they burn in fine breaths, his voice like the sound of many waters, as John saw him in heaven, wow. It causes me to tremble. And we need a little of the fear of God in our lives and in our churches because the judge of all the earth will do right. He's going to have the last say, and you don't negotiate with him. And we better get it right now. Father, thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Lord, we, we all must confess we're sinners. We have failed you so many, many times, Lord. We, you said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Oh God, may we have that fear. May we, we know you, you're our heavenly Father. We love you with all of our hearts and you love us. But Father, you are an awesome Father, creator of the universe. And Lord, we tremble before you because you don't accept any excuses. You have set a standard. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, and you want to bring us back into your image in the new heavens and the new earth. Lord, we look forward to that. In the meantime, Father God, help us to be faithful and you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.